you give away the ball that often. All right, what kind of questions do we see on 185, 186? 185, 186. Anything I could help you with? Turn the heat up. Turn the heat up. Just light Ethan on fire. Oh, well, he has gas. Match. Lighter. <laughs> no questions. We're good. We're feeling happy about this stuff. All right. All right. So today, I think you will hopefully think this is an all right gig. So three, three. So I'm at uh, page 67 of the notes. All right, so, so a normal distribution, we talked about kind of a, a basic idea of it, it, doing the little thing with the, the, uh, the dice, but a normal distribution is just basically where the, the mean and the median are basically the exact same thing, and the normal distribution curve should be symmetric. Now, this down here is the x-axis. Yeah, yeah. If you open up the big old lid, don't stick your finger in there because then I have to cut it away from your finger. All right, so a few things to notice about this. It is symmetric. This is the x-axis. But notice about as I go towards positive infinity this way, negative infinity this way, what do you notice about the graph? Is it crossing the x-axis? Is it touching the x-axis? No. Okay, so those are things to know about the normal distribution. Other things about the normal distribution, there is an area associated with a normal distribution. The area is 100% or an area of 1, if you went with that. Okay, meaning if I were to color in all of this region, it would have an area of 1 square unit, whatever the units are. Okay? Other things about it, in the very center, you hope to have your mean. Uh, you also hope to have your Q2, which is called your median. Okay? The mean can also be associated, we sometimes use a letter that looks like this. So the big difference between using X bar for the mean and mu, the Greek letter mu, is this is if we have a population or data. This is for everything or everyone. Okay? As far as this class goes, don't panic or be worried about X bar versus mu. They are interchangeable for us. Uh, but one deals with an entire population, one just deals with whatever your sample size is. Okay? I could do, I could take, uh, let's pick on Algebra 1. Algebra 1 for stirrup had 87 students take the last quiz. Okay? Now, this is just made up data because I don't remember off the top of my head. This region right here, X bar, because I'm using my students. I had an average score of 77%. But then I had a standard deviation. And standard deviation, we would use this Greek letter. Okay, it looks like a 6 fell over. Or a 9 trying to turn into a 6. I don't know. But the standard deviation of my test was um, 10%. Which means this, if I wanted to break up my data on this score, I would add 10% to 77 to get 87. I would add 10% to that to get to 97. And then I could go out a third standard deviation and being I don't give extra credit, it'd be impossible to get to, but that'd be 107. If I went to the left, I'd subtract 10, so I get a 67%. If we go one more standard deviation, these the greens are standard deviations, okay? That goes to 57, and then 47, 
And again, the 47, the 57, the 67 can all take place. But what you're doing when you talk about this information is this region here, this region here encompasses 34% of the population here, 34% of the population here. So this region in between these is 68% of the students. So this would say that 68% of my students in CP Algebra 1 on the last quiz, and again, this is fictitious data. I, did, I just made this up, you know, thinking about it. But if this was true. Of the 87 people that took this quiz, 68% of them had a score that fell between 67% and 87%, or one standard deviation from the mean. One standard deviation from the mean means you're either above it or below it. Remember, if it's... Um, if we called this zero, this would be one, this would be two, this would be three, this would be negative one, this would be negative two, this would be negative three, and it's just talking about how far the standard deviations go. You can go four standard deviations out, you can go five. It's just, you start talking about a less likely population when dealing with it. Um, this region here on a normal distribution encompasses 13.5%, so 13.5% of this made-up data of 87 students in my Algebra 1 taking this quiz, 13.5% of them scored between 87 and 97. This over here is also 13.5% that scored between a 57 and a 67. And then this is 2.35%. Uh, and this is 2.35%. So things that you should notice about it is a normal distribution curve has symmetry about the mean and the symmetry about the median. And again, you want your normal distribution to have the mean and median to be basically the same thing. Okay, does that make sense so far? So um, if, if, I were to add up, if I were to add up all of these scores here, it adds up to 99.7% of our area, okay? So that means that 0.3% happen three standard deviations, more than three standard deviations on each side, okay? So that's important to know. Um, so you're talking about a very unlikely event. And again, you all have you all have at least, yes, question. Those are the standard percentages? Yeah, for a normal distribution. That's what you do on homework? Huh? That's what you do on homework? Yes. There will be, so just know this, they are all rounded basically. So uh, if you were to use the calculator, you might, be, it might get one standard deviation, might actually only encompass 67.27%. But I mean, it's, you know, it's just, this is the main benchmark for it. So it's not an exact science right now. If you're given the normal curve, you base your answers on that. There's going to be some stuff we will use on the calculator called the normal CDF, which allows you to find the area under the curve. So if you had, if you had a student that scored here with some score, I can find the area all to the left of that, meaning this person did better than a certain percent or a large percent of everybody altogether. Okay. So let's talk. Let's talk uh, the fancy dancy colleges. Okay, and I'm not the fancy colleges. Let's go with the Ivy League. Okay. Talking Yale, Brown, uh, gosh, I can't, I can't even name them. So the Ivy League schools, I could go uh, Cornell, uh, what else? Uh, all, uh, I can't remember. Princeton, Princeton Harvard, Yale. Dartmouth. Oh, you guys are good. Okay, so Ivy League schools are actually private schools, but they are a, an elite amount. The Ivy League schools want the top 0.1% of high school graduates. 
now might be a little different than that, but it, when I was in school, so you're talking about a really small, you know, when you do the do the population, you're talking about a really small population out here. Okay. Now some might say, well, how do you how do you have that many in the 0.1 percent range? Well, how many people are graduating from high school nationwide or worldwide with some sort of high school equivalent? You have a lot. Figure you all have roughly, let's round up, a thousand students that'll walk with your graduating class. Okay. Grandview will have close to that, Cherokee Trail will have close to that, and Eagle Crest will have close to that. Okay, those are basically the four, you know, we're the largest, but those are like two, three, and four as far as school size. Um, there are some schools up in Boulder that are getting pretty close as well. But take any school, America, let's say, let's say there's 10,000 high schools with an average uh, senior class of say 500, and I'm making up this data, but if you multiply 500 times 10,000, you're talking about a large number. One, two, one, two, three, four. If I want 0.1% of that, so I'm going to multiply that by 0 0.01. 0 0.01 times <clears throat> 5 million graduates is some sort of number. Anyone got a calculator? It's 5 million times 0 0.01. <clears throat> Everyone hides their phone. 50,000? How much? 50? 50, comes out to 50,000, huh? So you're talking about 50,000 that are in the top 1%. Okay, so how do, how do those schools accommodate that? And I don't even know if it's 0.1%. It's just, actually, it's 5,000. This should have been 0.001. I'm sorry. So 5,000 kids. Okay? So, Stuart has to know how to convert a, or a percent to a decimal. So, that's kind of where, you know, the Ivy Leagues are going. They're looking at taking the top 5,000 kids to get them out to their school. Okay? And then as you start moving down, there are actually public Ivy League schools that exist as well. Uh, Michigan is a public Ivy League school. Uh, Miami of Ohio is an Ivy League school. Uh, i trying to think of a couple others. You can find them online. I just know Michigan and Miami of Ohio. Um, but that, that goes down. So those schools might be going after the point 0.5% of the stop, the top high school students. And then it goes down from there. Um, so as you go down, there is a ranking of schools, of colleges. So, you know, you have your top schools, you know, Yale, etc. And then you have your bottom schools. Like the ones that are going to take anybody, you have a pulse. Uh, the main school that does this um, Baylor, like <laughs> Yeah, you really have to slow down conversation. I'm kidding. Ohio State is not the bottom. I'm just I'm making fun of them. Um, so, no, there, but there are some definitely some bottom schools. Now, now here's the sad thing. This is a really sad thing. If you fell into that really top student category nationwide, if you look up what how much it costs to go to Yale each year, it's probably about $120,000 a year. And you might think, my goodness, that's ridiculous. Why would I pay that? Well, that's just their publication. I would bet you there's very few people at Yale University or one of the Ivy League schools that pay what they say their their yearly colleges. Okay, there are tons of scholarships. There's tons of money that comes for those kids, but at the bottom schools, so there are there are a lot of universities out there that are uh, for profit universities. Okay, they're traded on the New York Stock Exchange as a company. 
So they're going to sit there and they're going to take anybody. Because, hey, if we get 10,000 people to enroll, it doesn't matter if, you know, 9,000 of them can't even count. We'll take them. We'll convince them to get college loans. We'll get the money from the federal government. Then they'll be stuck with a student loan that they can't pay off. There's a lot of schools that do that. Um, University of Phoenix is one of them where I got my master's from. Okay. They charge an ungodly amount of money, but they know how the government allocates money as far as loans go. And they show people, this is how easy it is. Look, you're investing in your future. And then all of a sudden you get done with your, your bachelor of arts in, you know, changing batteries and calculators. And you have, you know, $300,000 worth of debt. So you have a mortgage payment that you have to pay over the next 10 years. It's crazy. Um, but those are just some things to be aware of. So yes, on the normal curve, you have some really good colleges and then you have some that are way down here. And a lot of times way down here, they are in the business of, work, of for profit, okay? Now, I imagine your households are very similar to my household, meaning I have a daughter who's a senior in college. I would say they decimated an entire forest with the amount of mailings we get from colleges and universities. There's times I go and I'm like, I don't even know what this is, and I'll look up and it's like, oh, this is on a small island in Hawaii? Yeah, I mean, it's just bombarding. And then some of them send you the really big fancy, oh, look at this, oh, this is a catalog, oh, this is great, okay? But it just comes like crazy. But that's just kind of, you know, what, what are colleges after? They want you to go, just because you got a, something in the mail doesn't mean you qualify for that school. It's just one of those things to go with. Okay, so the, the rule that we're mainly using for this on the bell curve, they we will refer to it as the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And that just means this, normal curve, this blue region is the 68% where you have your plus or one within the standard deviation. And then if I come down to the second standard deviation, this region here, including the 68%, encompasses 95% of the population. And then if I come out to a third standard deviation, that third standard deviation encompasses 99.9 or 99.7% of the area under the curve, leaving the small little 0.3% as the sum of the tails, okay? Again, this is how, if something is normally distributed, would work nicely for you. Um, so let's see, I'm on the back side, page 68. So they have some test scores there. Uh, you can use your calculator to see that the mean of the data set is 69.8, standard deviation is 13.6, and then you have the normal distribution that's done below, like I've done, where the 69.8 is the mean, or that's the zero z-score. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about, so on, on the homework, one of the questions, it's asking about like a specific percentage that's not a part of the rule. Cool. All How right. We find that? What, what percentage does it say? So the question is about height, and it says if Mason is taller than 84% of the U.S. male population has policy. So using the bell curve, how do we find that? Okay, so he, he's taller than this. So we're trying to figure out what percent he's taller than? Yes. Okay, let's let's look at our normal curve first. Or, no, sorry, he's, it says he's taller than 84%, so how okay. tall is he? Okay, so 84% basically falls someplace on this, okay? It falls somewhere on this. So... They want to know how many, what? How tall is he? How tall is he? It, it has inches. Okay. Inches. Uh, what does the, the mean average, say? The average is 69. Okay. What's the standard deviation? 2.5. Okay. So 71.5. So you just estimate mostly? Okay. Hang on. So uh, you got a calculator? Yeah. What's uh, 69 minus 2.5? 
what is uh, subtract 66 point 64? And then down here is 61.5, you even went further? Yeah. Okay, and then let's go the other way. 71 plus? So that'd be 74. 74. Yeah. And then adding 1.5, so? 2.5. And then 79, is that it? Okay, so it says that, so I know that this region here, See this in yellow. This region here is 68%. Okay. And then if I go back to my normal curve, I just want to remember it. So 13.5. And then 2.35. And then 0 0.15. Okay. So our person is 84% tall. So let's see. If I add 68, uh, let, let's make it easier. So from here over, you're talking about 50%, right? Yeah. So 50% plus uh, 34%. Oh, that's 84%. So from here, this way, is talking about that 84%. So our person that's at 80 and the 84th percent, what percent's taller? Well, he's taller. Is it asking for his height? Yeah. Okay, so this 84% actually fell at the 71.5 inches. Because so when I add from here down, so this is 50% from here down. And then this right here is 34%. 50 oh. plus 34 is 84, which this line here is at the 84. You know, so that means that, that, that makes sense. So, once, so this person at one standard deviation above the average is 71.5 inches tall. That means that people that are taller than 71.5 account for 16% of the population. Okay, so then if it is... Okay, that makes sense. So then if it says, like, what percent are shorter than 66.5 inches, oh, okay. you would just do, you would add up the percents that are, so 13.5 plus 2.35 plus 13. Yeah, so add this, add that, I can't see it anymore, and add that. So add them all together, and that's the percent? Okay. Yeah, if you, and, if, and sometimes, so I don't know what that comes out to, uh, um, 2.5, 16? Yeah. 16 percent, yeah. And then sometimes it might say taller, so basically sometimes it might be easier. You add this up and you subtract whatever that is from 100%, and that would then go this way. So you're talking talls and shorts. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, so uh, according to this, okay, uh, let's see. According to the 68.95.99.7 rule, 68% of the score should lie between 56.2 and 83.4. In actuality, 18 of the 30 scores lie within that gap, which is about 60%. That's 8 percentage away. According to the same rule, 95% of the scores should lie between 42.6 and 97. In actuality, it's uh, 29, and 30, 29 of 30 scores lie within that gap, which is 97%. So again, that's 2 percentage away. Same rule, 99.7. The data should lie between 29 and 110.6. In actuality, all 30 scores lie in that gap, which results in 100%. So again, it's because you're dealing with a sample. So is it good enough to say that the data represents normal distribution? You know, that's where your judgment call comes into play. But again, we keep saying this over and over. That happened to be 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That was 30 scores. Okay, 30 scores, you're talking about a small sample. If it went up to 3,000 scores, it would probably distribute out a little bit further. Um, in addition, the 69.8 is the median, is 74, which leads us that it's skewed left. The final verdict that this data doesn't for, follow a, a normal distribution. So normal distribution looks like this, okay? Skew left, skew right, basically do that, okay? So... It pulls it right or left. What's what's influence in it is remember things that are doing it. I don't want that. I don't want to say the mean. The mean 
can pull things left or right. And that's why when you look at a normal distribution, you want to think about what is the median? Is the median equal to the mean? If so, you probably more than likely dealing with a normal distribution. If the median is really far away from the mean, then your graph is being pulled to the right or to the left. Okay? So many things in life deal with the normal curve. Okay? Um, you all have phones out because I've seen it. Um, Somebody find for me the average ACT score. Verify. Verify for me. You guys have phones up. Twenty-five? All right, let's go with the twenty-five. Okay. I heard more 25s than anything else. Okay, now those of you who got 25, it said found it to be 25. Find me the standard deviation. Yeah, it should. They should have that on the ACT score. But if you if you found 25 on yours, you're you're on the website that would give you the one what the information I want. Anyone have a standard deviation they want to share? 5.8. 5.8. So I'm going to make, I'm going to just for stir, stir up easiness, let's round it to 6. Sound good? All right. So the the ACT scores, there's a lot of people have took it, taken the ACT, agreed? I would say that our um, median, so our Q2 data which isn't always listed is going to be very very close to 25. Okay, you're talking about tens of thousands of these tests that are given each year. Each year, this ACT has been given year after year after year after year after year. Agree? So you have a lot of information to do the ACT. So if you did the normal distribution, right here you have 25. And then if 6, I know I just made that up, uh, 19. So 68% of your population that takes the ACT scores between between a 19 and a 31. Okay? So a lot of times a university might say, hey, let's be within one standard deviation of the mean. Well, you're talking about 68% of all high school graduates that you'd be trying to target. Okay? Um, if I went down another standard deviation, if I subtracted 6 from 19, that gives me 13. If I added 6 to that, that gives me a 37. Now, here's the tough thing with that. What's the best score you can get on the ACT? 36. So now this is falling outside of that realm. Okay? So where, where are you going to score on this? Um, again, 68% falls here. And then... If you break this down, if I went from here over, you're talking about 50% of my data is that way. From here up, 50% of my data is that way. So half scored above the average, half scored below the average. Half scored above the median, half scored below the median. And then you could break it into the other category saying, well, this is 13.5, and then this is a smaller region that you're talking about. So when you look at this information, it's great, but let's talk another thing. AP class. Okay? So let's say the best score on a particular ACT test, they award up to 100 points. So what they're going to do in, the, in, a, in an AP environment, and this is kind of cool that they do this, AP renorms its, its test every year. So there's some years that you might have scored, gotten a 5, but you might not have done it as well as years that were good. This is a benefit right now. Has there been something going on worldwide for like the past 18, 19 months that has jacked up public education like crazy? So do you think kids are doing as well on AP tests as they had in years previous years that didn't have COVID? Yeah, I mean, last year, let's face it, most teachers at this school covered about 60% of their content. Okay, because of how the schedule was made. 
we couldn't cover everything we wanted. Now, I know that if you are in an AP course, they tried playing this hurry up game and probably put a lot of stress and anxiety on you because it's like, dude, I'm seeing you twice a week and then I have to meet on a Zoom meeting where four kids are screwing around eating Cheetos the whole time and you're Snapchatting each other the entire time. So it's like, he doesn't know I'm going to turn my camera off. You know, I want to know how I knew if a kid was still in class or not. Okay, the Zoom meeting's over. Billy, we're over. <laughs> Billy. Billy. Yeah. <laughs> Billy had the camera off, said, oh, start things up here. All right. So we uh we know that people were off on Zoom calls. They didn't they didn't do it. So there were some people that chose not to do education wisely. Yes, there were some technical things. There were some teachers figuring out a new way to present. But that, that's all part of it. But an AP score, let's say, let's say this year's AP stats, um, AP stats class, let's say the average score is a 50%. And the standard deviation is 15%. So that means that if you got 50 points, you got 65 points, you got 75 points, or 80 points, excuse me. If I got uh, 35 points, or if I got 20 points, this is, you, your best score on AP test is a five, right? You cannot get a zero, okay. So, the people that are within one standard deviation, so 68% of the students that took this AP test get a three. The people that fell here got a four. The people that fell here got a five. The people that fell here got a two. People that are over here got a one. So basically, if you look at this, if you had 20 points or less on the AP statistics exam, you score a one. It's not good enough for college credit, but it's the experience. Most college or universities are going to give you some sort of credit towards whatever AP course you took out of three, four, or five. Okay? So a three, four, or five, you're talking about, for, you know, you have a person who's getting college credit who scored a little bit higher than 35 out of 100 points, but then you have somebody who's getting a little bit more college credit who scored an 80 or above. But that's where your one, two, three, four, five comes from. If you are in the IB exam, the IB breaks it into a category of seven. Okay, so they go out a third standard deviation both ways. Okay, and that's where the scoring comes from. But AP renormalizes each and every year. Okay, is this really the score that happens each and every year? I don't know. I would say most years, I would I would say like let's say the 50 was normal up to this point, and then the COVID year kicked in. Okay, this might have dropped to a 40. But they still awarded the three, the four, and the five the college credit when they took it, which is kind of cool. And the thing is, if they didn't do that, if they didn't do that with the COVID year, this 40 falls here. Okay, so you're get, you're mainly getting the only people that are going to probably get a three on this test where there was a certain amount of people that got fives and fours. Okay, that's how the scoring takes place. And again, you want, it's good to renormalize stuff. And then you also can go back and evaluate, was there something that took place? Okay. I would say 100% of the population that is above the age of five in this world have some comprehension that COVID exists, okay? Whether, you know, it's like, wow, I have to wear a mask. I mean, there's going to be, there's children coming up right now that they think everything that's normal about school is we always wear masks in school. When those kids become seniors, I hope they don't have masks on still, Okay. Will the masks go away? I think they will. And I can't wait till the day that they do because you know what? I, I hate to say this, but I don't know a lot of your names, not because I'm dumb. Well, I am dumb. <laughs> but I am a face person. I enjoy smiles. I enjoy seeing a face. Okay? Most people, I go from here up. I know your eyes up. I don't know what, what's behind you. And I miss that. And I know you all miss that, but that's what we have. So, um, hey, you guys want a lot of homework tonight? Um, yeah, let's do tons. <clears throat> so let's do page 187.
188. Is that all it is? It's not a third page of it, is it? Yeah, let's do that. And we'll definitely go over that on Monday. That'll be due Monday. Tuesday, we'll work on the um, the review as a class. And then Wednesday, we will do our quiz for 31 to 33. So we'll be setting those up. Cool? All right. I'm going to stop recording.